thoracoabdominal emergencies. I like to color code things by organ. You can see this is how we will break this down. The first group are thoracic emergencies, the next group intestinal emergencies, and lastly, viscous and vessel emergencies. I'm, if you've seen my presentations before, they're usually just straight case presentation, but I thought some additional information about the pathologies we'll be viewing would be helpful for people so you'll see I have the a typical age range and gender distribution, pink for female, blue for male, white for equal in both genders, right? We will do the annual incidence of each of these pathologies per 100,000, that's in green on the second line. I will present icons representing the risk factors in red, the percentage mortality, uh, for that entity. And then last, the CT sensitivity. All of these stats were taken from the uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information. Just to put things in context, for the incidence of per 100,000 is pretty much how every one of these pathologies is reported. Thought I'd uh, give you some reference points. So the number one killer is uh, cardiac or cardiovascular, and that is slightly over 200 per 100,000 people. And actually, if you add stroke in there, it's up around 230. Uh, next, not pictured, is cancers of all types are 137 per 100,000. And then we come down to these other things that I thought were interesting. This is opiate overdose is 30 per 100,000. Car wrecks are 12. Per 100,000. Medical errors are 10 per 100,000. And curiously enough, suicide sits right between those at 11. And then lastly, the murder rate in the US is 5 per 100,000, uh, which actually is uh, compares rather favorably to other countries. The highest in the world, by the way, is Honduras at over 40 per 100,000 murders a year. All right, let's get on with our first case. This is a case of pulmonary embolism, pretty much equal uh, men and women, and typically from 60 to 70. Although women typically are the younger and men typically are the older patients with this. The annual incidence is 65 per 100,000, making this actually the most common entity we'll be seeing tonight. The risk factors, and these are the specific high risk factors. I thought a uh, plane ride and long bus journey, things like that, don't quite make the grade for the highest level risk. Those are surgery, pregnancy, long bone fracture, cancer, and institutionalization. All right, mortality. Mortality is 10% when accurately diagnosed and treated, 30% if it goes undiagnosed at presentation. And lastly, CT is about 87% sensitive for this entity. And I think that's actually pretty good. I'm going to comment on the CT sensitivity because uh, sometimes the stats don't necessarily agree uh, with my personal experience. So I'll call that out when that's the case. I think this number is probably accurate. All right, so here is our pulmonary embolism case. Of course, there's the filling defect in the right pulmonary artery. Let's look at another level here. You can see bronchial compression there. The left lower lobe bronchus is pinched right there, uh, just past its origin. And the culprits there are, are these two necrotic lymph nodes on either side of it. You can just see that hypodensity centrally, uh, suggesting those are necrotic nodes. Under the diaphragm, you can see there are heterogeneous liver lesions. If you look at the left adrenal, it is significantly enlarged, and there is a contiguous mass there running from the left adrenal to the left kidney. Lastly, one cut lower, you can see that enhancing mass, very similar in density and heterogeneity to the, the renal mass, is actually invading that left renal vein. So I'm sure you know what's happened. Here we see the right pulmonary artery emboli. 
Now we'll go up a little bit and look at that pinched left lower lobe bronchus. Look at that wonderfully atelectatic and collapsed left lower lobe. A little, a little bit of air in the bronchi there, but that should never be enough to dissuade you. There's that enlarged adrenal, contiguous with that left renal mass. And lastly, here's that invasion into the left renal vein. So you can tell, of course, that this uh, precipitated a PE. So a couple of things to point out about this case. One is there are filling defects in all three right lung lobes. So there's ventilation perfusion mismatch throughout the entire right lung. But then in the left lung, you have that atelectatic left lower lobe. So there's total ventilation perfusion mismatch there as well. So out of five lobes of lung that this patient has, four are nearly complete ventilation perfusion mismatch. And this patient is really running on one out of five lobes. Pretty impressive. All right. So the one other point I like to make about this is we do run artificial intelligence algorithms. and uh, we run them on all kinds of life-threatening pathologies, pneumoperitoneum, aortic dissection, PE. These are flagged by a computer program when they enter our system and are bumped to the top of the prioritization uh, list, right, of all the radiologist work lists when a life-threatening condition is detected. So that is obviously very, very helpful. But when people hear about that, they get nervous, right? In fact, there, were, there was a run of several years where radiology applications were down because people specifically were afraid that artificial intelligence was going to replace them. So this was a case that was flagged for a pulmonary embolism, uh, one of the first, in fact, that was identified when we started using that algorithm. This dates back some years now. But the interesting thing is, and I say this many times, right, that we can build algorithms to find or exclude individual pathologies, right? We have an algorithm for PE, an algorithm for aortic dissection, but that's a long way from an algorithm that tells me what's wrong, right? So this was flagged for PE, but I think our jobs are safe because it's going to be a long time before they build an algorithm that can say, this is metastatic renal cell carcinoma with vein invasion, leading to a pulmonary embolism, that's going to be a long time coming, folks. So I think, uh, I think we're all safe. All right, let's move to our next one. Infectious endocarditis. This is more common in males between 35 and 55. The annual incidence is 15 out of 100,000. And notably, that is three times the rate in the EU where it is about five per 100,000 and where, of course, uh, drugs of all kinds are legal. And I'm sure that's the reason uh, for that reduced rate. The risk factors, intravenous drug use, defibrillators, and central venous catheters are the ones that rank highest. The mortality is 20% in hospital, but 40% one-year mortality. Uh, partly due to recidivism, I'm sure, but also partly due to the uh, lasting complications that can develop. CT scan in this case was given, I think, a, <laughs> an overestimation at uh, around 97, 98% sensitive. I think that's way too sensitive. Now, there are some manifestations where it's pretty reliable, uh, but I have not, uh, not found the identification of vegetations, for instance, the definitive uh, endocarditis diagnosis. Uh, to be anywhere near that kind of sensitivity. So in fact, I would tell you that's the one I disagree with the most. I spent my entire career looking for an endocarditis case uh, where I could really see the vegetation on the valve material. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively rare thing. So there is a huge pulmonary artery filling defect. And here, some wedge-shaped and even early cavitating lesions in the right lower lobe, peripheral wedge-shaped, but also you can see there are a couple of little dots there of lucency 
that suggests just the uh, smallest of cavitary lesions. Now let's go to the soft tissue windows though, and there it is. I uh, sought it all my life, but a huge vegetation on the tricuspid valve. Of course, tricuspid endocarditis is uh, more common in the intravenous drug user population. Uh, the other thing to note is the size of that right atrium. Uh, this tricuspid endocarditis is almost always associated with pretty dramatic levels of tricuspid regurgitation. That's a pretty wimpy valve and it breaks down pretty quickly in this uh, setting. All right, so here is our right pulmonary artery filling defect. And you notice it goes all the way down into the right lower lobe. And there is that vegetation on the tricuspid valve. You can see the hepatic venous backflow under the diaphragm, which uh, suggests that tricuspid regurgitation as well. Look at the size of the right atrium there. And there's that venous backflow. All right, let's look at the lung windows. See a bunch of little cavitary lesions. It is sometimes helpful that these are peripheral in diagnosing septic emboli. I've found that uh, they don't always have to be. They will be kind of generally peripheral in location, but again, it's not a requirement. All right, that is a case of tricuspid endocarditis.